so for those of you who weren't, we had over 100 people in this room, and we talked about how to create a thriving economy or continue it and build on it in this valley. And we took some of the topics that came up that night, and uh, we're doing focus, uh, focus each month on one of those. And this is our first one, as you notice, on food distribution, how to get the food in the valley, two people in the valley, <laughs> And who knows where to go, maybe beyond, there's all kinds of ways we can go with it, but that's what was brought up that night. Um, next month, we're going to do one on education in the schools and how that is affecting the economy, and then just keep an eye on the website or a time up our mailing list to find out what we're doing each month thereafter. So, um, Elaine and I are, are hosting news, um, and that, well, along with the Hive, we're both high posts here, and Elaine is going to facilitate tonight, so thank you all for being here. Um, wow, thanks everybody for coming. I, um, I might do a lot of pointing, but I lost my voice on New Year's Day and still haven't come back, so if you can't hear me, I apologize. I probably can't boost it anymore. <laughs> That's, uh, um, but I, I, I hope that mostly you all will be doing talking anyway. And, um, when, when it came up that we wanted to do some follow-on things, because the, the, the meeting that was here was really, it was really good, and, and it was very energized, and it was very uh, focused on what the possible was and what we can do, um, and, and how this area can, can try to thrive. And we all know that Delta County and North Fork Valley are up against some, some tough things, and there's, there's some tough stuff happening. Um, uh, on the local front, and there's also some, some really good stuff happening in some businesses and some things that are moving into the area. And um, at, at the end of, of well, it, the, the final part of that meeting, it sort of put out and said, well, what is it we can do to move ourselves to the future? What, what can we do? And, and there were a list of things that came out, and when Carolyn and Joanna and I got together, um, so we can't just let this die, you know, we, we need to go more with it, we need to go deeper and to see if we can actually move the needle, move it to the next steps. And so we said, well, how are we going to do it? Who's going to facilitate it? How are we going to run it? And we decided that for the series of meetings, we would, uh, we would get various people to, to facilitate the meetings and bring it together. And that ultimately we would hope that you all in the room will, will get the energy, get on the train, and, and get things moving in a direction that we feel, that we as a community feel need to happen. And, um, and so what these meetings are going to be about is not about what didn't work in the past, or how we screwed it up in the past, or um, why things are bad, but more in the direction of what are the possibilities, what is the future, how can we make this the place that we really want it to be. And, um, and when we put the list together and the <coughs> enhancing, improving, doing something with the local food system came up as a suggestion. Um, and the person, unfortunately, is not here yet, the person who brought it up, I think it was in the context of, well, why, why can't I get local food? But you can. <laughs> and, and part of that knowledge base, which I know every producer in the room bumps into, of, you know, but we do produce food. Why don't you come and get it? <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, um, but this guy represents a part of the community that you know, is looking for maybe one stop shopping. I don't know. Um, so, I've been involved for about the last nine or ten years, ever since I got out of here in the valley, because it was the food thing that really attracted us here. Like, wow, we can get this amazing stuff in this little, little place. And I, I, I was I mean, just very invested in it, and um, when I kept hearing things like, well, no, we can't do it because it's transportation and distribution, and that's a problem. Okay, what century are we in, first of all? You know, why is that a problem? And can't we do something about it? And can't we turn that around? Um, and, and I started to get it. You know, I, I was that newcomer that came and said, well, yeah, we can do that, we can do that. I started to get it, why it was hard. 
Um, but a lot of newcomers come in. A lot of people come and, and they want to know where the food is. <coughs> and um, maybe we just need to keep re-educating them on it. But um, um, where, where I'd, I'd kind of like to maybe help take this is, first of all, identifying what we do have here. And my assumption here tonight, I know we have some county people and we have uh, I see Jade from Region 10 is here, yeah. um, but it's, to put this into context, are we mostly talking about North Fork Valley? Is, is that what, because you all are from here, mm -hmm. and I think we want to talk about the extensions of the, the other places in the county and beyond, and Michelle, we can put mantras here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, just a thing. Um, <laughs> um, but a, a talk might be helpful to start off with talking about what is here and what we have access to, and then get into the discussion of what's needed. Once we know what's here, what is still needed, and then the what's next. So how do we get what we need? Um, and to, to quote Mick Jagger, <laughs> you can't always get what you want. You try, try, try. You get what you need. Um, and, and I think that's what we call us for. Um, so, so just to start, we've got a lot of producers in the room. How many people are producers? How many people are consumers? <laughs> uh, how many non-farmers in the non-farmers, non-ranchers in the next year? Good. Um, so we, we have a couple of different perspectives. Okay? Um, so the question as it was posed at, at the, the last forum was, how come I, how come I can't get to food? How come why do I need to go, you know, on six different mesas to get what I want? I said, really? Is that the way you see it? Um, so I started to think about what we have here. And um, and the first thing I did, and this is why I'm not in the creative arts. Uh, <laughs> but I started thinking about, we do have markets. And, and one of the things people often say around here is, how come we don't have a great farmer's market? Well, there's reasons, and, and farmers, I think, know there's reasons. Um, but we do have markets. And when I started adding it up, I found actually quite a few markets that carry local stuff. So just as a point of reference, um, we've got Hardens over on the Hodgkin side, Delicious Orchards, Stalls, Homestead, uh, Don's Markets carrying local stuff. Trading Post is dedicated to it. Uh, Black Ridge. Yeah. Black Ridge. Thank you. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to say that it's okay for people to sit on those tables back there. Yeah. Okay. TLC. You can go to TLC and get stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, we'll get there. I, I'm just thinking of like, like a retail space market. I do. But then how do you count like folks like us because we're a retail farm? Yeah. yeah. I'll count you. Don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> because with the way this, this guy who came from some city, um, what he was thinking of is why can't I go to a market where I can get all my local stuff? So I can buy Uji's meat, I can buy eggs, I can buy chickens, I can buy produce, I can buy anything I want and I'll look for it. And, and there's a good look on that because I know you all know that there are some things that you can't. <laughs> um, so, you know, my, I hang with the bully director all the time. And there's, a, there's, yeah, okay. there's, um, to people who are, who are saying, where is it at? Go to the bully directory. There's also a directory from uh, Valley Food Partnership <coughs> called Love and Local. And there's a couple copies in the back of the room that is 
Montrose, Olathe, and, and in Belk County. So there's a good resource guide there. Um, but um, any other, now some of these obviously are seasonal, but Hardens is there, um, Homestead, Dunn's, Trade Post are year round. How many people use those markets? Um, how many people sell into those markets? Just, yeah, let go. Um, and they, you know, and, and I know that people go crazy if they can't find TLC greens and, and tons. It's coming, it's coming. So, so to me, that's one one access point out of the markets that we have. Um, what else? Do we, what's what else is here? A bunch of farms, a bunch of producers. For the consumer, what do the consumers have that, that you can get access? Lots of CSAs. CSAs. <coughs> And the not CSAs, CSA like life. CSA life, like like small potatoes, which is not a CSA, it's right. a order in advance. Right. But um, and does anybody know how many CSAs we have per year? I bet we can do them. Look in the direction. <laughs> 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 Of the of consumers here, how many people use the CSAs? <laughs> or the CSA line? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are CSAs a problem for anybody? Or what that means for the group? Hearing intern there are pain in the butt. Depending on how the cost is structured, it's a high up front. Valley, CSA's one solution. 
Um, Over in uh, Durango, or somewhere in that very general vicinity, there's a guy named Holy Bai. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He um, works with several farmers, and then he meets them, I think, at an uh, old gas station or a place where they can park, and they bring their stuff. And I think he's dealing with restaurants and that type as opposed to individuals. And then he distributes it. They have both. It's a it's a cooperatively owned um, system called Southwest Farm Fresh, oh, right. and they now have um, refrigerated cargo trailers. So they call it a cloud-based distribution system, where they can put the trailers in variable locations depending on the, the need that technique. One thing that would be really helpful for new people is if we could combine the plethora of directories. Because VOGA has some people, but there's people that will not advertise in VOGA right. because they just aren't going to do that. We've now got this directory I've never heard of. There's the Farm Fresh one. Yeah. As a producer, you know, we sell yarn, so we want to be in the creative directory. If we had just one, yeah. the North Fork book with little sections for everybody, it would be one, we could all be in it, right? And two, it would be better for the consumer because then they've got all of it. They don't have to go around. Oh, I didn't know that that directly existed, right? Why would people not want to be a Because they're not organic, particularly if you're an and, animal and raiser. And organic. And rules however, in the US. we are in Voga and we are not organic. Right. But a lot of people don't know that you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I won't be a sense, not until the U.S. rules change for animals. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> and there's, there's, not, there's a lot of producers that are not. It's, it's, it's by, you, you, yeah, I'm into it. You accept no. uh, it. Local farm first is what's here. Mm -hmm. And it's a distribution. Mm -hmm. Online farm market. How does that work? And is somebody here from local farm first? Mike? Good job on that one.
and could handle variable um, variable weight or variable prices per item. But we're actually looking at switching now um, to potentially the same um, interface as Local Farms First because we can't um, subsidize the cost anymore. Joel Salatin's online stuff handles variable things okay. as well. So does the land place that's down fire? Do you know the Foxfire? Foxfire Farms down in Durango. Durango. Mm -hmm. They have an online ordering that handles, you know, mean yeah. and variable things it's very true. well. Yeah, it should be hard. Yeah. I don't I have a question. Are there producers in the room that don't use Local Farms First because of the increase in price that Local Farms First puts on it? Or is it, does everybody use it regardless of that 20% increase? Okay. Yeah, I stopped using it for that reason. And then the customers that I had, I just do direct. Direct yeah. sales. Mm -hmm. um, but they were mostly oh. served serving the need for Gunnison Crested Butte. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were right. trying to sort of drop tier because they asked us to be a drop tier. Yeah. They were looking at the figurations. Right. So they were looking at Yeah, My understanding is that they would like to be able to, to service yes. this right. town. Right. And the, the original idea of it was to reach out to Montrose, mm -hmm. Grand Junction, even in, in other counties, you know, take it on a step. What's, what would be needed in order for them to be able to serve this problem? My question is that so this one guy came into the meeting and said he wants local food, but of the 30,000 people that live in Delta County, how many of them really want local food? Is this really the problem? <laughs> I mean, Scotty doesn't really buy local produce because it's a lost leader to him. No one goes there to buy local produce because they have a CSA or they go to their neighbor or they grow it themselves. I mean, the reason the Panhandle Farms Market failed is because when I was there, at least, we sold stuff and people came up and said, what do you have for me today? And I said, I got this purple tomatillo. I love growing up. I have those in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, you know, I mean, it's, this is all well and good, but I guess I, I question the whole underpinning. Like, is there actually people in this county? I mean, how many of you go to City Market? Yep. You know, and of the $60,000 a day that gets, every day gets spent at City Market, the question is, is, how do you pull those dollars? How do you make it attractive and not a trading post? Because the people who go to City Market aren't going to go to the trading post. Right. That's just the deal. Right. And, you know, Scott doesn't want to buy that much local produce because it's just going to rot on his shelf. So what do the local producers care need or want to make their, your businesses more viable? It's a lot of facilities. <laughs> what is it that you're paying here for? What is it that you're hoping to get out of this? What, what do you need? I'm not a producer, but I work for VOGA, and I have a lot of interactions with a lot of farmers around the valley, and the thing that I keep hearing is that they need drivers. They need their food. They have markets. They have places to sell their food. They have no way to get it there unless they themselves are leaving the farm. And if they themselves are leaving the farm, then there's no one at the farm farming. So what they, and you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but there needs to be a local farm first that goes to Steamboat. There needs to be a Front Range, Durango. Mm -hmm. It needs to be bigger. There needs to be people that take that food and go out. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that is what I've been hearing. Mm -hmm. I think the rub that we feel is that we're shipping all of our product, most of the product, to the Front Range or out of state. And we have Grand Junction and Salt Lake at least is, is three passes closer, um, but it seems like the Grand Junction market is something we're not exploring, or there isn't, maybe there's not a market there for what we have. There seems to be a lot of people that are really need something. So that, I think that's the easiest <laughs> map of the
So there's there's distribution now out of Durango. There's uh, a lot, a lot of distribution coming out of the front range um, for small for smaller farms. And um, I think it's probably just a matter of time before a lot of trucks start trying to access the the resort the resort counties um, as far as supply. Um, there's a lot of see there's a lot of cooperatives and then organizations like local foods that are that are building bigger and bigger markets that are seeing higher and higher and higher um, revenue points and I think you're gonna start moving this way and I think if they saw a magnet in this area they would they would accelerate or at least find a midpoint, a mid drop point somewhere in the resort in the resort. Okay. 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 One of the things that would be key there is a place where everything can be picked up where farmers can bring their stuff, maybe like a co-op, and then uh, it could be picked up and taken to other locations. So the farmers would have to work to kind of make that home happen. And there's, and there's a lot of reasons that there's something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a, did you work with the, there's a hub down Durango Way? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been part of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're they're doing okay. They're they're facing growing pains, and I mean, the, a lot of the problem is that, uh, with a lot of what we're saying is, I mean, as soon as you add another person trying to make even baseline profit or even baseline, you know, some you know whatever, you you take away money from the producer, and in most of our situations, that's not some that's not dollars we can afford to lose. So, I mean, that's a problem that they're facing in Southwest Colorado, which is the idea that. We wanted this aggregation hub. We wanted this ability to transport things, but that has a cost, and most people were not in a position to change their practices in order to accommodate for that new model. I mean, most people basically kept doing the same thing they were doing, when in reality, most people probably needed to increase their acreage under cultivation and and see it and see changes in that respect. Um, I think that's something we see a lot of places is that. Is that as soon as you add another element, as soon as you add another cost, you add another cost to the farm or two. So, um, but here's the unique play because we have farms on a slightly larger scale, especially the fruit growers have a different model, which is has that sort of distribution house built in a little bit more. Um, but I'm not. But sorry, I don't know where that's addressed. But there, there's a lot of trucks going around, you know, and I think, um, and I think that there's, I think that. Part of something that could happen is just uh, find an opportunity to sort of raise a flag, say, we're right here, and we're ready for pickup. You're saying pickup from distribution network. Mr. From all these other. <coughs> so they come here to pick up. There's a, there's a, oh, yeah. and maybe we can speak a little more. There's a grant that was recently just written, which was a food hub, sort of uh, kind of a cooperation, cooperative mm -hmm. of cooperative like a federation of food hubs. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of that was going to look at. Uh, place Olathe, um, yeah. so Southwest Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Southwest um, Arkansas Valley, so essentially Chaffee County. Yeah. Um, so we'll get providing technical assistance to basically connect the, the food hubs to have a more um, cohesive, cooperatively managed distribution and, system. And we would clearly be on that map. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we're we're a major food producing region in the state. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about the, the Montrose grant? Yes, so Montrose, um, through the Valley Food Partnership and the Montrose Downtown Development Authority are in the midst of a feasibility study to do a downtown food hub um, just off of Main Street in Montrose. And we're doing that partially as an aggregation and distribution facility, but also similar to the North Fork. Um, to connect all of the local foods efforts. So that current space is adjacent to the plaza where the summer farmer's market um, is and actually houses the current winter's farmer's market. Um, and in the front of that space is a six day a week retail shop of straw hat um, farms. And so they sell their, um, their produce value added goods and then also source a number of products from, from other farms. Um, so that would be not only a very visible community space, but also potentially be a drop point and could connect 
we've already talked to local farms first that you know in a couple of years that could connect the markets without adding you know significant mileage to their route or even potential expand uh, see the expansion from the Southwest Farm Fresh out of, out of Durango. Um, so that that's why I asked for Montrose to be on the on the map. Um, but that food hub also has great potential because it's you know backed by by the city and the city actually owns the all the adjacent plots to potentially expand into greater aggregation and distribution capability. Um, and the other thing Montrose has is we have a um, an additional um, online purchasing capability with both retail and wholesale um, sides to it. Route County is also just initiated an online program. Mm -hmm. I, I did have another thought. It's what Harrison was saying earlier is that there are some, there's a growth <coughs> time frame to make these distribution ideas really viable. One of the interim things that I'm really passionate about is doing market expansion through making local foods more affordable to low-income families. And so we're, I'm actually talking with an EBT specialist at the USDA and learning more about the funding to make um, the EBT, the SNAP machines, um, <coughs> usable at farm stands and for, for CSAs. And so to actually, that might actually divert some of the, the city market dollars. And the other thing that Valley Food Partnership is doing is we run a program called Local Pharmacy RX, where families that are receiving SNAP benefits and also at risk for diet-related diseases can qualify for um, pharmacy bucks, which are basically um, $40 a week vouchers that are redeemable at the farmer's markets. Um, and then they participate in family cooking and nutrition education classes. But that 12-week pilot of you know nine families this, this first year accounted for 5% of the sales of the Montrose Farmers Market. Um, and it's, it's growing, uh, you know, 400 times next year, and we've already been approached by other organizations around the state, and it could very well be viable to expand to Delta County, especially in the state lot in the next few years, if we find the right funding source for it. Um, and do, I'm wondering from the room here, do you think you could increase sales here if you had a, a method to accept um, EBT and SNAP? Is that a barrier? What, what type of price point? Do they have to give up a price point in order to sell for the EBT and SNAP program? I think that you know a lot of the price points are fairly comparable, and that you know from working with a number of these families in the last year or so. They didn't know like the Montrose Farmers Market accepted SNAP, and that because of the SNAP benefits they are receiving, they're actually somewhat more poised to afford it, and that's that's coming from them, um, because they're they're receiving the assistance. So that we see it as a viable strategy in Montrose. I'm wondering. I get about ten percent of my income at the guys from Farmers Market from SNAP. Mm -hmm. CSA, 
which is completely and totally possible. My problem was that we sold enough flowers that it was non-food income, which they were trying to make sure you're not selling cigarettes and alcohol, you know, flowers didn't really Unfortunately, <laughs> 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 it didn't really, didn't really work. They kind of weeded us out in the wrong direction, but from a CSA standpoint, it's totally feasible mm -hmm. and letting people know that, and you know, it's really not our process to fill out the paperwork. And, and there's people. federal money to take care of the upfront costs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping to kind of make sure that there's a strong connection between those dollars and this region mm -hmm. in the coming year. So what if we looked at the other side of the coin or a different angle on this and um, <coughs> as far as a need, I think what we need here is to create a, a demand for the product that exists and an appreciation for the quality so that the price and the, and the effort that goes into it. You know, I, I've been working with farms all over, visiting the farms that offer agritourism around the state. And one of the benefits of agritourism is that when people come onto your farm and learn how damn hard it is to get that stuff to grow, and how much better it tastes when it's fresh, and how much more nutritious, people see that value and they're willing to spend it. And they're, they're seeing uh, decreases in health issues, lower, lower blood pressure, etc. But, but that information isn't easily out there. It's not being pushed, probably because it's not in the best interest of big supermarkets for that knowledge to be out there. I don't know, but it, it is a growing demand for good and nutritious food and people are willing to pay more for it. John, no, um, John, John, John. John Cooley, John Cooley is the master of that. John Cooley has people walk away from his farm going, yes, I'll pay you $8 a pound of potatoes. Okay. Yes. Great. Right. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up here. Um, some of the federal laws restrict promoting the improved nutrition of some of the food that's grown here. So, for instance, I cannot go and label grass-finished meat differently from the federal standard for how it's labeled. So any, and agritourism is basically how we get all our customers because I have to talk to the people to convince them why they have to pay more for their product. I think if you used a media campaign in which consumers gave testimonial about their own experience, then that, that would, uh, that becomes this is my experience, and that's a person's opinion. It's not a federal endorsement or a scientific fact for labeling. It's not labeling. That's that's the yeah. labeling it. That's the yeah. it's kind of it's a very fine line. Yeah. You know, how you advertise it. It is. Yeah. And say, and I say what's in your food. So if you do nutrient density testing and you promote that, you're not making any claims as far as a, a nutrition component or health. Because that's when you get into trouble when you're making claims. But if you just say what's in it, you're totally allowed to do that. And that goes way beyond the, the, the back of the box label of the generic, that's not what's in your food, that's just what uh, the standards are, right? Not for meat. And, right. Meat um, has, a fixed, has a fixed approved nutrition that the USDA approves, and you cannot change it. And you can't say what's in your nope. specific food? Nope. You can't say that ours has you can't, you, can't, can't, you can't test it and do it and say that it's different. Mm. Yeah, that's for me, but most people in this market are going to be good to look at that too. And of course, the well, and, and another thing is that, because I'm, I'm pretty new to this area and as a consumer, I'm not a producer, and um, I love all the local, you know, produce and products that come out of here, and I have my local CSA, and beyond that, I'm trying to fill the gaps as far as what I need that's not in that box or might be different, and, uh, you know, it's, I'm such in the habit of coming from that urban hub of going to the one-stop super shop uh, and doing that routine that I find it can still in here months. And it's difficult for me to just drop out of that habit and go, well, what else do I need to do? How do I dial this in, in and make sure I'm getting what I want, how I want it, and from whom I want it? And so I think there's a big uh, consumer education component to that. Yeah. That if you tell people how to do it, consumer yeah. education. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Different from just changing yeah. the habits. And even recipes, what do I do with kale? Oh my God. Yeah. And what is it? 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 What is it?
mostly what people have been talking about is vegetables and, and produce. Um, on the meat side, uh, do people know how to get good meat? Um, and I do. <laughs> um, it's not easy for me when every now and then I say, oh, I want a whole chicken. Where do I go get a whole organic chicken like that? It can lead you to places. It's not as part of the education. It's, it's part of the value where you have research and you can order it in advance. And, 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 and can, can somebody speak to the, the how to? Because there's getting a chicken in the grocery store, which is USDA, and there's getting a chicken from the farmer, which is getting a chicken from the farmer. Right. Find a live chicken. And having it slaughtered. For and having them do the service. Um, and, it, you know, the, 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 I'm glad that somebody brought up the uh, consumer education and habits. Part of living in this valley is discovering how to navigate, you know, what's there. Uji and Ken are one of the few people that have parts, right? Um, and, and they they slaughter your sheep and and you can buy chops. You can buy you can buy parts. Um, many of the other meat producers, it's a whole animal, a quarter, a half, and um, for me, that's that's where the best meat is. Now, all the other places, homestead market, you, you can get parts from there. But they're a big enough operation, and they're USDA, they're Delta, they're great. Um, what what we've changed our habit to, and and this and this is a whole other adventure in eating for those who have not grew up on farms. What do you do with those other parts? <laughs> um, That's where consumer education comes yes. in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think there's a, a component here that I'm certainly involved in, and that's um, teaching um, and getting that information out to people on how to, and, and that's reflective of the whole, you know, nutritional movement that's, that's going on, and so. I'm really excited about some of the things that are going to be happening in the Valley with cooking education and instruction and nutritional things. And We're also so seeing a trend in the culinary side of things with the snap to tail process. Yes, so that exactly. now you're, the whole animal is being used and served in restaurants as opposed to just the chop or just the right. steak. Yeah, yeah I'm coming to come out of the city just think beef comes in prime rib. <laughs> and, it comes in plastic. And, 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 <laughs> pork is all <laughs> and, and, yeah. One of the things that's been real helpful in the sheep industry is that the land board has been going around all around the country talking to producers. I think the beef board has done it, but you guys did the, the new cutting instructions, mm -hmm. which work really well if you can get somebody to do them, mm -hmm. that, that do change how carcasses are cut oh, and yeah. give you different mm -hmm. cuts mm -hmm. that you can sell. And with that, with the lamb side, they are now providing recipes. And I have been told that they are now going to come on four by six recipe cards in this next year so that they will fit in a recipe box more easily. Uh -huh. So there is some of that available. Um, the pork producers do it, beef guys, you guys do it, the lamb producers do it, I'm not sure about poultry. But there are North Fork recipes. I mean like during wine season I have a recipe that goes with wines for each of the wineries that we talk with and we market with. So they can go there, buy their wine, come. Yeah, it gives people a little more meat. confidence about what that, yeah. what that, that part is. And that might be something that we could add is more of the North Fork recipes. <laughs> um, it's, it's a change in lifestyle, and it really is. Uh, we, got our, we got our pig, we got pig, and I've got like 19 pounds of ground pork. Right. What am I going to do with that? But I will. And I will make a sausage and I will do all kinds of things with it. When I have gone into a grocery store 10 years ago and bought 19 pounds of ground pork, 
I don't think so. Um, got some great soup bones and things that just made a great pot of soup. Would I have 10 years ago done it? No. I wouldn't have known what to do with it. And they wouldn't have sold it. It would be what? Thrown out, scrapped, whatever. But, um, but using all the animals, it's, it's been great. Oh, uh, thank you. And so uh, I'm Wayne Davis, uh, Mesa Winds Farm and Winery, work on Rogers Mesa, and we have, and by the cut, by the way, but uh, we have uh, organic fruit and um, also uh, lamb. And uh, I'm, I'm also working with the Western Colorado Congress um, on a project that we're doing in conjunction with the Western Organization of Resource Councils uh, regionally to strengthen the independent uh, meat, produce, meat processors in, um, you know, 84% of all the beef you find in the grocery store is processed by, by four multinational corporations uh, and, and, they're, and they manipulate the market illegally under the Packers and Stock Charts Act, and, but they have so much uh, 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 leverage at USDA that they get away with it. Uh, in spite of the efforts of the Western Organization and Resource Councils over 30 years to try to get them to enforce the law. So the, so the new direction that WCC and WORK are taking is to um, tr find out what the needs are locally for, to, to make the connection between the ranchers and the producers and the, and the uh, independent um, uh, meat processors and the consumers. And, you know, we're going to work with our membership, the uh, WCC membership, uh, uh, to, 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 make, to find out what the needs are and make that, that, those connections. And one of the things that I've learned is that it's just amazing the, the facilities that we already have here in the Valley. Uh, you know, certainly Homestead uh, is a USD and USDA inspected meat processor uh, right there in Delta. and um, that's where our, our land goes. Um, but we also, you know, uh, we have the uh, Hotchkiss Meats, we ha have um, uh, Carla, and I, unfortunately, one of the uh, Little River Meats, um, Marlon is no longer doing it. And that's one of the things that we're noticing is that, like farmers, meat processors, butchers are getting old, and we don't have people coming along to take their place. And so we want to try to recruit people who are interested in, you know, in, 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 in learning that trade and find the education for them and, and support that to happen. So I uh, just wanted you to know that that's, that's uh, and we're fortunate here, I mean, the entire state of Wyoming doesn't have an independent meat process. Really? And we have, you know. But Wyoming has a portable. There's not one in the first meat portable. Not one where? There's one in the first meat portable. In the first meat yeah, and, uh, you guys go there. Uh, uh, Princess Beef gets their beef done there. I think we have uh, Susa. Uh, some of the, yeah, some of um, High Wire. But that's the thing about meat producers. I, and I, for the first time, I had my first alpaca steak. You know, we have an alpaca farm that processes meat and sells it. And you can get it locally. And speaking of education around how to use the different meat cuts, I bought a whole goat from Emily, and she knows I live by myself, and when she delivered it to me, it was packaged in whatever it was in the amount for one person, and she had written on it, stew me, or leg, and I like to stew this, or broil it, and she had little things on all the packages like that. It made a huge difference. <laughs> Buy a second goat, or otherwise I might have been going, I'm not sure what to do with something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 which process are over in the salt? Harrison is first. I think that, uh, for, for a point, I appreciate you for bringing that up. I mean, when there are legal issues that are impacting us, when there are policy and legislative issues, like, there are a lot of main groups that are, that exist solely to represent the needs of farmers. So, um, and there are ways to get to get to that. WC is a wonderful one. I work for Farmers Union, and we do. A, I think we do a pretty bad job of, of getting our needs and building the lawmakers' hands. Um, but we have to speak up in order to do that. Um, 
Another thing, going to sort of the broader culture of a place, um, and I have, I have two ideas. One is that, um, you know, for any meat producer, there's uh, checkoff systems that exist, where, for example, with beef, every beef you sell, a dollar from that is put into a fund to promote beef. And that's all it does. I mean, beef is complicated. Beef actually is much, is much more than that. Pork is okay, and lamb is okay. Um, but you could you could look at Boga or or an organization to look at doing a similar thing around here, basically creating a pot of funds to do strictly promotional work and education work. A dollar out of every hundred that's sold goes to goes to promoting and developing uh, consumer education. It's an idea, it's something that other industries are using. Um, and the other another thing is that, you know, there's a lot of the we were approached by there's a healthcare or there's a health insurance cooperative in Colorado that just started called Colorado Health App, and they came to us at one point saying, we'd like to give away a CSA share for every first year purchaser of, of health insurance. We think it's a big part of the mm -hmm. promotion of, of, you know, of healthy, of preventative care. And, and I mean, in that way, A, if you think that's a good idea, you should be get health call insurance, and you should tell them that you think that's a good idea, because they really are doing a good job. And the other thing is that local businesses that don't miss, that service people that aren't necessarily linked into the community of, of, of foodies and eaters, that, you know, go into the bank and, you you know, if you open a new account, you get 20 bucks to spend at a farmer's market. Trying to, try to tap into that idea. Um, because those are, those are the entities and those institutions that I think are, were here before, you know, before the sort of food movement and, and still contact a lot of people outside of that circle. So if you want to increase that, I think it would be a really good way. And things like health insurance, things like promoting programs like this would be really good and would bring outside money into things like this. Yeah, one of the things we, when we were back from looking at how can we get CSAs into the center point places where there's the most traffic through and the most employees, and wouldn't the hospital be a place to start? Yeah. And um, at, this, no, at the time I went and talked to some administrators there and they just, they just weren't there, they weren't ready. But um, what a concept, you help me food, maybe you won't get sick. On the consumer education side too, one of the things that we're seeing statewide and across the country is the crediting of local farmers and restaurants that you're eating this really nice fresh salad. Where did you get the produce? And Lynn can talk about this. I, I bring media in and they're sitting there. Here comes Lynn running into the living farm with this big bunch of salad and next thing you know it's out on the plate and the people are going, what she just brought in, is that what I'm eating? And yes, and she yes. just picked it when we were on the tour an hour earlier. And they're just like, wow. And so then they, they just go, it, it's that fresh, it's that good. And they go and buy directly from the farmers. So the farmers have had that type of thing in place, to have consumers come and buy directly from them. That way they're, they're being driven to the farm instead of you having to buy the produce to them. Yeah, the only thing that doesn't work in that line is you can't take them to see the lambs and then think that they'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> and so one, one, one thing that just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you can't name them and you can't show the eyes or your picture. Right, right. Don't get the vegan dish, I guarantee you. <laughs>
staff, basically, to make that come to fruition. And our chapter, we don't have the, the resources at this time to really take it on uh, pretty good. Um, it's something that's been, it's in the back of our minds, but we, uh, to do it properly, um, it, it takes uh, uh, a, uh, it, it takes a solid effort. And it just can't take uh, like two or three people saying, oh, that's nice, you can talk to people. I mean, it's, a, it's almost like a full-time job. That being said, though, Slow Food, Western Slope does donate $1,000 worth of local meat to the schools every year. And that is an ongoing effort that they have. Well, it's essentially it's the $1,000 of meat. It's the, it's the price difference between um, homestead meat and whatever it is that comes on the truck. Um, and, um, and so there's a price differential there. So it buys a lot more than, than just the house dollars of meat. But I mean, the schools will, will buy from you. I mean, there's a bunch of meetings that got people together. I mean, you can't expect the same price here. You get to expect wholesale prices. Like real wholesale prices. You know, like, yeah, you know, when we, when we did the, so you have to have a lot. You have to have a lot of the product to yeah. really make them happy. Yeah. And it's a hard season. It's a seasonal thing. It's like so many of these things. It's growing for the season of your market. And the schools open in September, and they're open right now, and I give to you. Yeah. Maybe with the, the stuff for them. Right. With the, the programs that Slow Food uh, <coughs> uh, promotes or supports are usually uh, gardens at the schools. Denver is about the is the um, the best example, probably in the U.S. of uh, um, how to take uh, farm school gardens to a, such a spot where or to a to a, uh, a point where they are doing it year round, and that's that took a lot of effort. Um, and it's an urban area; they have the resources, they have the people, and the time, and all that to, to do that. But it's still only partially successful. Well, uh, the, the, actually, the, the point of contact for that program is now at the is, is at the Slow Food USA level. It's like the program manager for the USA for farm school gardens. Well, and, and again, and, 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 and um, the monitors here, but Michelle just walked back and the school gardens. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's been a good success with the support of of Livewell, Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, for school gardens, and the uh, interesting thing about that, it may not feed the school cafeteria completely, or it may contribute a little bit. The stuff that does go in, the kids are pretty proud of, and and you know, and it's legal, and and they can, um, but they're also learning. Mm -hmm. They're learning about growing. They're learning about healthy food, and um, they're learning that it's not that hard to grow things. So they take they take that to another level. And yeah, I don't think any other, anybody ever expects school gardens to fur, um, furnish the whole cafeteria thing, but it has it has a lot of other effects. Yeah, yeah. Along those lines, I just wanted to chime in. I helped start a really small school garden at Family Elementary last year. Yeah. And before that, at a, a school where we used to live, and I don't think there's anything I've been involved with that has convinced me more how much power kids have, even to affect their parents, they would try kale, <laughs> you know, and then parents would come up to me and be like, oh my God, my kid, you know, I mean, not all kids, but my kid would, my kid's begging for me to buy these foods I've never bought before. And last year we did, we grew enough um, on the last day of school to provide salad for every kid and to make them kale and berry smoothies. And, um, but anyways, I'm not at that school anymore and the teacher who sponsored that is not at that school anymore. And if anybody wants to help that school, um, they are very open and receptive mm -hmm. to some help from the community. Monkey's Hay is also starting a school garden. And just from our experience in Montrose, basically we went into the elementaries, the, the middle schools, the high schools. We built the gardens with or we, we built the gardens <laughs> under a lot of different circumstances. And then two to three years later, you know, we now have a district level support system for them. And then, but really the only way to make these gardens viable is basically for the school district or someone on behalf of the school district is to hire a school garden educator because otherwise you have that, that same story. 
energy and loss of energy around those arms. You need somebody inside. Yeah. But they, they have a lot of grant funding. A lot of grant funding. Yeah. And the school district puts a lot of money into that food. Yeah. And the other thing about Slide is that there's not a lot of farmers out there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not they're not competing really with anyone because they're because they do. But I mean, also they have they have a paid farmer. They have maybe even two paid farmers mm -hmm. plus three other people on staff. So I mean it's a big uh, it's a big program. Huh? And I just like to make note that some people have been leaving and I'm wondering these things that we need over here, um, what's the next step? What's the next step to people getting together? I know Vogue is an organization, but I don't know what their capability is. What's the next step to get farmers together to create some of these things together as a, as a team to help each other for education in the valley and, and other things that are Well, these are just about farmers. I, I, yeah, I, I, I well, I just want to give everybody an update. Um, our GIS department at the county is actually building the layers for each of these. We've got the, and we're going to showcase it at the tourism meeting, um, we've got the layers for the restaurants, the layers for the CSAs, the layers for the BOGA directory. We're not ready to roll it out to the on the county website yet because we're still testing it, you know, but we've already got kind of that one-stop place ready to go once we get it all ground true. Um, so it wouldn't take much, you know, because we, and we're, we pulled out the VOGA directory and, and so right now we're building the links and all of that. But that's what we're doing with our GIS department. It'll be a map and it's all of Delta County and all of the ag in, in Delta County, anybody that sells direct or the farmer's market or a restaurant or an health care facility or something like that, there'll be that many different layers. But again, watch for that soon and that'll start to address what started out the conversation is a is where do I even go to combine all of these directories together. Now it's not hard copy, it's strictly going to be the interactive maps. And it'll be on the Delta County It'll be on the Delta County website soon. It's not there yet, but that's, you know, again, starting, you ask for the next steps. I mean, we've started to pull all of that together on, on the... Um, <coughs> on the GIS side, and that's what we're going to showcase at the Tourism mm -hmm. Board on January 14th. So. Did you get the West Hill mm -hmm. APA folks as well? Mm -hmm. Anything that's printed that, that, that we've gathered over the years is what we've got. So we know it's not complete. Mm -hmm. When we roll it out and it doesn't have someone, you know, by all means that's the beauty of GIS is it can be added. So. Do, you, do, do you or, or Paul at, at GS, do you guys need anything from like this group? Um, we'll probably the, bring it, you know, we're <coughs> going to bring it to the tourism to roll it out. And again, we'll bring it here if you want, roll it out. We'll bring it to Voga, you know, because we know we don't have everyone or or every, everything. So, yeah. And things change. <laughs> things change. But I mean, that's something that actually, you know, it came as a result of a, a extended conversation. We don't have that one map. We have several maps, but let's put them on our county website. So that's a start. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. Uh, next. Well, that's kind of the virtual um, way of getting everything in one place to look at, but it might be helpful if there was a co-op where there could be some education, some cooking classes, mm -hmm. farmers could bring their produce, people could pick up their CSAs, an actual uh, location that was kind of central to the county that would be operated by the farmers on a cooperative basis, so there wouldn't be necessarily um, big overlay infrastructure to be taking uh, part in the profits. So would you see that as, as a hub, uh, as like a food hub? It and could also, yeah, it could also be, uh, it could have many multiple, um, you know, it could go with the meat, it could go with the produce, it could go with the education, and just kind of everything. So someone new to the county would just know to go there and it would be a place to um, maybe be laid out like a general store, Cracker Barrels, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it needs a place that is welcoming and, and um, offers many different, many different things and, and especially for the farmers to be kind of 
participants. Do you, can you envision someone or some organization taking that on? Um, well, you know, I don't, I don't know how it would unfold, but I think if enough people really wanted to see it happen, that it could evolve. We provide technical services for it. So, farmers union. Isn't the one in the southwest, wasn't it started as a, a non-profit and then it's a for-profit business that runs it? Something like that? It has a doing... There, that's a model that a lot of people use for yes. a non-profit will be from a for-profit. What happened in the southwest was it started as Bully Buys Company, mm -hmm. which, was a, which was a for-profit business. Mm -hmm. And it was a different one. Adopted. Co-ops are traditionally for-profit businesses. Yeah, for, so, so there's a... Um, what would, it, what would it mean from your experience with Farmers Union? Who, who would get together? How, how, would, how would that, what would that look like? I'll say right now, I'm not convinced that a prop is the right option. I think that there's a lot of moving pieces there. Yes. Um, but it would look like producers that had an idea of what the co-op would do for them. Typically, you need to identify where your bottlenecks are, where are the, where are the places that you could see costs come down because you're working together. Um, and you need enough people to come together to look at that. I mean, but you can also look at multi-stakeholder models where you could have producer members, and you could have consumer members, um, you could have industry members. Um, I don't know, Chris, where, when you start a dehydrating, where are you gonna move your food to and on what? Um, that's a good question. That's the distribution and transportation piece. There's a whole local food part yeah. that we need components to. And so I'm willing to collaborate with anyone who wants to help put those pieces together. But that's absolutely a critical part is to say, okay, well, we need transportation and distribution. That's profitable company for somebody. And so if somebody wants to help or to start it, I'm willing to. Right, so but that's, that's another venture who's, you know, with people that, that are going to step forward and put these pieces in place. I'm, I'm all about, uh, you know, working with people to do that. So I'm going to be right here in Paonia. I'm going to be a reliable buyer for people that are producing uh, fruits and vegetables here. And so um, that product that doesn't serve the local market, I uh, would be really happy to talk to people about buying. And also moving, if you're going to have a truck. Yeah, I mean, it's not just about me have the truck. I might have a truck, but um, I'm not in the dist dist distribution game. Yeah. So for me to have outlay a lot of capital to buy multiple yeah. trucks to get to all these different farms, that's one of the big uh, question marks that I have, and I'd love to talk to people about it. So I think you, we, you need to come up with stakeholders that have a legitimate, that believe, that think that having, that there is a way to cut their costs and increase their efficiency and get those stakeholders together, whether that's consumers, producers, aftermarket stuff, and, and have and have a group that works together on that. And that would be the group that we would work with right. to help us help. Matt Can't hide. Matt did a feasibility study sort of stuff over the last year looking at a couple of aspects. One of it was, was the, the food side, and it was also a community center aspect. And, uh, maybe you just say a little bit about it, which one. Um, so, yeah, last year I received, the last one I received a grant from the Heart and Soul Foundation to do a feasibility study to start a food preservation center, community food preservation center. And one of the things I did was I did a survey. And all the results from my survey absolutely support what everyone is saying here and what we need. Um, some of the big questions or big data points that were brought up is 84, so I had over 120 respondents to just the consumer and then I had about 15 producers. But on the consumer survey, 84% of people said that they wanted a centralized local food outlet. So that's pretty clear. Um, and then it, it needs to be an accessible spot. People said that Aonia was a good choice, Hotchkiss was a more preferable choice. Um, I also found that producers were 
60% of producers sold less than 30% of their stuff in Delta County, but 80% of consumers want to sell more in the county. And so what I'm working on right now is kind of devising a plan to potentially open a brick and mortar local food market uh, in an accessible location, which from what my study shows is that would be Hotchkiss. Um, and the, the idea is for it to be a multifaceted organization uh, because just the market alone isn't going to be enough to sustain an operation. So I think pairing that with a combination of things, including distribution, as well as possibly a preservation effort. Another thing in my survey showed that what people most preserve, most prefer as preserved foods were frozen foods, and that's rather easy to do. So getting the, getting the infrastructure to make that happen, then you open a market and anything else that goes to waste, you freeze that and it's ready to distribute. Um, <coughs> The time is also prime for an opportunity like this. Um, local markets have opened up, like for example, in Hotchkiss at least, the Sisson's Agricultural Market shut down. And as we can all see from here, all of us, a lot of us are producers. And so maybe not only would this be a food market, but it could be a farmery, a place where people could get their farming needs. Uh, and it could potentially be a, a co-op or some sort of joint collaboration. Um, anyways, I do have some interested people that are interested in making this happen. And if anyone else is interested in seeing how we can do this as a community without it being too blocked down with like too many voices, uh, I'm totally open. and. I'm open to share all the information I have. And this uh, report is public, um, so it's successful. Let me know if anyone would like the info to support whatever they're doing. Okay. Harrison, there's a model going on down in the Arkansas Valley. Dan Hobbs is always talking about the, the ABOG. ABOG, but they just completed their, they're working on that food center. Yeah. The, the Excelsior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Food Hub. Is that, is that, is that model playing it for this group as well, or is it you're only a lot different? Um, you know, what, what Arkansas, so this is Arkansas Valley Organic Growers, and for those of you who don't know, Arkansas Valley Organic Growers, they started very small with a number of producers that were sort of tired, they were all doing fairly large commutes to yeah. markets in, yeah. out in Colorado Springs and other, in, in some cases, South Denver. And a few of them got together and really slowly started building this project that, um, that's, that, were, that helped to, the first thing they did was get a truck that could help bring produce around. Uh, that built into um, storage and washing options. This has eventually led to um, them leasing a, an old abandoned middle school to have large scale cold, cold storage, um, a wash, a, a mechanized wash line, um, large scale uh, bins for pickup and delivery, and um, and then truck delivery and, and, a, and a collective CSA. Um, they're a really unique position. I mean, Dan farms. Um, on 30 acres, and he has relatively focused production. Garlic, mostly. A lot of garlic, chiles, squash. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of model, like, if it, these models don't work very well when you have a lot of CSA sort of styled farms. They work much better when you have people that have more focused growing. So so I don't know, I mean, that's, that's just kind of anecdotal. Um, and I see a lot of these projects fail. I, I mean, uh, I see a lot of these budgets fail. I mean, the Boulder Co-op failed. It's like, how many Boulder Yeah, that's rough. Yeah, you know, and so... So, so why did the ones succeed? Well, the ones succeed... So the ones that succeed are... <coughs> are what? Are farmer-built, exclusively. Okay. The ones that succeed are the ones, in my experience, that... Farmers build in the ground up because there is a distinct and definitive need that they need met, and that's and that 
and they build it together. And usually it's built slowly over time. Well, and they understand the capitalization and the costs right. of going into these things. And, and how, how, how do they fund a startup? So when you, when you start doing it, you start small and your funds are small. I mean, the, one of the ideas of, of a co-op is that you have um, collective financing, basically. So a group of people can come together and create a little bit of a shared risk pool with their own capital. Pass that a lot of it comes from grants or loans. Um, there's the, our, the, the, um, we, we provide services through our rural cooperative development grants. Um, and then there's the uh, rural business enterprise grants and a number of different USDA grants that people usually go for. And those are usually to the tune of fifty to $70,000. And then there's other grants that people will go for and we usually help do that. And um, like I said, and you were asking me about this, the for-profit, non-profit. Sometimes co-ops will have a for-profit model, which is the co-op, because more, more often than not, co-ops you know, almost exclusively call up their for-profit businesses. And then they'll have a non-profit outside of that, which does a lot of those grant yeah. applications. Yeah. And the two have some sort of like rental agreement. But they're, I mean, they're for, essentially they're the same. Right? <coughs> Otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, you know, I have to warn against moving into things too fast, um, and that the things that I have seen be most successful are ones that are very farmer driven, very, very farmer driven. When when consumers get in there, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I think it also the ones that have been successful have groups of farmers who grow specific crops, and they have farmers who grow on a scale that really no one here grows on a those scales. Three acres, five acres. You don't see a lot of them succeeding on those scales. You know, you need someone who's growing twenty or thirty acres of, and not growing twenty and thirty acres of twenty and thirty different crops. Mm -hmm. Growing twenty and thirty acres of five or six different crops. But, and you need four or five different farmers like that. The ones that have been really big and successful is a lot of them. Are, but farmers shift. Too, you know, like farmers. That's one of the things that when you go slowly. You have people that have more diversified operations. Right. That begin but I'm just saying what's here right now is a bunch of small farms who are all incredibly diverse. Well, but that's not true. I mean, the, for us fruit growers, we have larger farms that are much more focused. They could be right. But totally the, the fruit that. growers, sure, but they have the, the least of the distribution woes.
will it work? You know, and to do the analysis of it. Is that? Yeah. Sounds like a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> Who said that? Say more about I think it's, I mean, I think right now is a momentous opportunity. I mean, everyone looks around the country and people want local food, right? We're nestled right in the heart of like lucrative markets, right over mountain passes. I mean, a combination of subsidizing a local, uh, well priced brick and mortar store with like a higher price direct to consumer marketing distribution system or to wholesale systems. It, to restaurants in those places, I mean, you have your different streams of profit coming in, and if you juggle them right, it's feasible. And I think that considering not only the environment nationally, but the environment within our own community here, like mine shutting down, uh, you know, our our valley looking for a transition to, you know, lean more on our cornerstone of agriculture, and. Uh, and then you look at all the other struggling businesses, and everyone here in this valley wants local food. But who has time to drive to anywhere else other than one location? I mean, really. I, I just picked up a job from 7.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. And I get home and I feel like I don't have any time, you know? And that's... Like, I need something quick, accessible, and easy. And not to mention, like, as Americans, that's what our culture is, has been brought to, is convenience. And as hard as that is, like, we need to kind of cater to that. I guess where I'm coming from is, why do another feasibility study? Like, it already seems like this is necessary, the farmers need it. It's, why, do an, why spend a year doing a feasibility study when it's clear that there is a room full of producers here that know that it's needed, that they, I'm assuming, already have markets. They just need to get their food to the market and still be able to farm. So I guess my question is, why do a feasibility study and why not just go for something like some money to help a project of a distribution, like even to get a, you know, market over to, you know, get trucks that are already on the route get somebody to come over here? Like, how, how can we do that? Or how can we buy a truck collectively in order to get it out? Or get a truck to come in collectively? I think the feasibility study may be a waste of time. I mean, I, I can't help but, but, but basically we can do that. We can still be studies that we can do so far. Um, and, and Matt, to your point, like, like, I totally hear you, but I also am so cautious. You know what I mean? Like I've seen small communities and I've seen the attempts to do this, and it's really hard. You have to do really, 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 really good. Like you know, like the joke that a lot of like consumer food hubs, the joke about a lot of like, consumer food hubs is that they're just sort of like going out of business over a long period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and that's not the, and that's I mean, that's during the natural foods. That was Zuma and Nankis. You know, that was the Boulder Co-op. I mean, these are places that are in vibrant and vibrant areas where you think, where people say they want to buy local food, but these are really capital-intensive projects. They're really, there's huge amounts of money. Why did the Boulder fail? Because people said they would shop there, and then they did. Why? Why do you think they didn't shop there? Because convenient. Why was it just convenient? Because it's convenient. Was it nice when you walked in there? Yeah, it was great. Oh my god, this place was adorable. Oh, it was nice and it was easily accessed. Oh yeah, yeah, it was right on the hill. And it's fair. You look at what else is available in Boulder. Yeah. You look at what else is available here. I know, but but please, like, you just really need to be cautious. I, I have to agree with him because we all, I mean, look at us. We're all locals. We all know where to go get our CSAs. Why would I go to a storefront and pay 5% more when it's like, oh, I can go to Beth and Frank and pay 20 bucks instead of 25 bucks for this carton of apples. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I agree. It's, you know, the, as much as we um, want to say that. Me, but I think the point that, of the store is that you don't have to run to six different farms to get your save your two dollars. Yeah, but it can't be one day a week. Yeah, exactly. And I do agree, like it is in theory it is really nice. And Matt is my partner. Like of course I want to support what he's doing and what he thinks, but I do think he brings up a good point. Is like 
how many local people are actually going to shop there and that's what's going to hold that business because as local, I mean we have this great influx of tourism but in the winter months the locals are what's going to hold it and what, is the, what are the so, chances? So one, so back to the, the dread is what they're saying. And one thing that money could be used for would be to go to other communities and see what's working. You know, to build, to not, to not necessarily get input from this community, but to develop and look at models that are working in other places. You know, AVOG works because they're out in the middle of nowhere. You know what I mean? And we're, and that's not exactly what we're talking about here. So that's not exactly the model they use. Right. Um, but there's another side to it is to say, well, would would Delta County or would the local market support it? And can this education and change of habits? be the thing that the private. Yeah, but I'm not going to build a business on something like that. Well, you, no, you're not. But you're going to count on this and make it work over time. Yeah. Because uh, it has to happen. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uji. Uji. One thing that's been real successful in the UK, because I talked to a lot of farmers over there, is that they have badgered, beaten, harassed, and threatened the major the major Tesco, Asda, the big, big food chains. foods chains, the big supermarkets. Oh, and so they're Kroger's. they're now putting in basically there's the Welsh aisle if you're going to Wales and the what local Welsh producers bring their stuff there. The the coal mine that's doing the cheese brings their cheese to the to the Welsh aisle at the big Tesco's. Um, so maybe so one it would be thing the next step beyond the, the organic aisle in city market. You know, how do you how do you get yeah. how do you get a, mm -hmm. uh, a half an aisle in the Hotchkiss City Market for local folk, or a half an aisle down in Delta? I mean, actually, the city market in Hotchkiss has a surprisingly good organic food section. It's better than Delta's. So what you got to do is you got to put it on a truck and send it to Denver. They manage to harangue the corporate headquarters to the point the farmers go directly to their local supermarket. So if I go to a supermarket in Cardiff, I'm not going to get the same Welsh lamb as if I go to one in Tartt mm -hmm. or in Snowdonia. And I only know about the Welsh folks because those are the ones I talk to. But you know, it's happening all and over. It, it's been approached with, with other. You know, if they can break out in their own corporate structure, that's that's the problem. Is that they're they're dictated? But why not ask the question? I mean, Walmart says it. I love that there was a, a sign. Um, took a picture of it once. It was a, a Montreal City Market, and you know, we sell local produce. Yeah. And it was right over the banana counter. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is everybody familiar with? what could be used as a model um, of a, a little food hub, you know, market in Carbondale. The Annex is doing that right now and they've got um, assorted goods from, you know, meat and vegetables and cheeses and, and everything else. And, you know, they're starting out pretty small, but I can see, you know, I visit that every time I go to Carbondale and they're growing. And it's pretty solid, you know, what they've established, and that might be just a market. I could see something like that here um, with also a transportation component. Mm -hmm. That is the, the hub for the locals, and then, you know, the transportation and the uh, food preparation. Um, rolled. Yeah, all rolled into one. Yeah. But, but as a consumer here, I have to say that the more I have discovered all of the, the locations in the valley and the, the producers that make all this wonderful food, I hardly ever go to City Market anymore. I mean, I, I don't go there for convenience, but I have to say that, boy, it sure would help my life to have one central location to get all these goods at. And not everybody can spend, you know, a portion of every day of the week going to a different place to get something. And it would be really helpful. 
Um, Matt, is it worth is it worth getting a group of people to work with you? Um, yeah, I'd be willing to talk to some people. Um, we have, we also at, at our at our at the last meeting so here on local economy we have people representing the investor community. Um, that one. Yeah, I mean. To be completely honest, I I have an idea kind of thrashed out, and I do have some seriously interested parties, um, but it's going to take a lot more than just a few. Um, so, I guess if you're interested in learning more about what I do have put together and who else is interested and what it would take to make it feasible, um, I can give people my contact information. And I'm willing to talk more. Uh, but I do also have a full-time job, <laughs> and so, like everyone else, my time is limited. Do we need to look at getting, basically, funding for staff time for you? Absolutely, that's actually probably the largest expense behind, actually, uh, doing some construction. Uh, or remodeling, better said. Yeah, labor is a big cost. So, um, at the... And, and we got people representing the region, the county, the state. I put you in the state, Kelly, because you're out there with those people. Well, um, I have a commercial break I'd like to throw in at the end. Just yeah, okay. But, <laughs> but for are the resources, tell me, are the resources out there? Are people just not asking for them? Can it be found? I mean, we have resources for, 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 for staff, yeah. I mean, we have, we're, we're not going to fund some of the staff time for a year, but we've got money for a little bit. Um, it's, if it really matters, if it's really important, if this, if that would make it work, then forget about the money. Let's go find it. Does AVOG have marketing staff? Uh, yeah. Kind of. like that because 
from what I hear, farmers are pretty busy farming, so they, <laughs> they don't have a lot of time to do entrepreneurial ventures that's appropriate. And so that's up to me and, and Matt and other people who, um, who that's what they do, right? So, um, and that way we can attract more people. Um, I was talking to Wayne about this earlier. Um, young entrepreneurs or even whatever age they are, just to get people in here to start new companies, to make this a, an entrepreneurial mecca. Because there's so many opportunities and there's all the pieces are here. And we can create tons of jobs that way, create a lot of economic activity and create a lot of demand for the local food that you guys are growing. There's an interesting article yesterday in the paper. Um, I don't remember what I was reading. It, was on, it wasn't in the paper, it was online. Um, how basically 30 somethings, 30 year olds, are turning away from the urban areas, and they were particularly featuring um, uh, the, the Northeast, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and how many are coming. Who have not had a farming background, but but they're being drawn to do something. And they're doing things a little bit different, and they're setting up specialty farms, and they're committed to make it work. I and think it was on CPR. Was it on CPR? I think it was. Yeah. yeah. That's a great yeah. Story. <laughs> and you know, we see people with passion. Come on, Matt, Chris. We see people with passion for that, and as a community, question because how do we how do we keep them here? How do we retain? How do we how do we keep it going? And correct me if I'm wrong, you're not looking to be billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> but a nice lifestyle would be nice. Um, a house would be great. But there is a trend. There's a, there's a trend in the country of, of, of people doing that, right? Um, so, you know, what are we trying to add in the paper? Serial entrepreneurs want it. Yeah, um, I was just thinking, like, being a writer, I could totally see this is a story in the Denver Post about the North Fork Valley and all the stuff that we want to do and talking about it. I mean, I think most people read that and, yeah. and say, that's a young person who wants to be a political lady. Yeah, but so <laughs> guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd love to write that story. So all right. You know, right. Okay. So push down for that. Yeah, and another thing I was going to mention, just being a food writer too, I can personally attest to the fact that restaurateurs want our food. Um, I just did a story in Crested Butte a few months ago, and I went to a, a, I think the only farm table restaurant there is called Sunflower, mm -hmm. and they were telling me, we want to buy from local farmers, but we're having to go to these neighboring states to get it, because we just, we, we have these people that are coming coming to Preston View, and other ski areas too, they're well cultured, they have money, they expect local, but healthy, good food, and these restaurateurs are not able to provide it. The supply is just not there, and I don't know. But as someone who's tried to do that, it's hard to, yes. Why? restaurants are hard. Why? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the program, the, the, there's one down in Cortez, and then one that's starting up the mantras of the local, healthy so it's to make that bridge mm -hmm. and um, and there there are people who have got some funding to figure out how to get the food from the farm to the restaurants and a commitment and that's that's the key a commitment on the part of the restaurant is that why it's hard that they will serve yeah. well it's just that um, piece. you have to jack basically lived in his truck and he still got it mm -hmm. It's 12 to 16 hours a day for work because you have to be on the phone all the time taking orders. You have no life. It's amazing what he would do just to keep this food. Then he has to have a heater in the truck in the winter time so the food doesn't freeze. And then sometimes he sleeps in the sleeping bag in the back of the truck. So maybe it's not just consumer. I mean, maybe the restaurants need to be educated as well. But they work on the price point too. That's what yeah. Major companies like yeah. Cisco that want to make it. We have seen restaurants that want it enough. They do. And they send their chefs over here. So then you have, then you have issues of like how much are they buying? You know, yeah. It's, but I mean, it's a start. I, I yeah. dream that yeah. farmers yeah. would yeah. have yeah. 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 restaurant people yeah. expect the farmer to show up on the back door. We're starting to see that shift. The new chef gets out all the old suppliers. But what if we change the paradigm? What if we change the narrative that chefs want to come to the park? It's 
So and the other thing is changing the paradigm of how do we shop as consumers. Um, and, and, and I think that has changed. I think it can be done. I know we do it. We buy, we buy what, 80, 90% of our stuff is from farms, is local. Is it different? You know, when Jim first came out here, he was in the habit of going, you know, from Whole Foods to Safeway to whatever, and trying to trying to put a menu together. And now we come out, we get our box and go, wow, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> and and it creates the week's meal. So there's a, that, that just consumer thing I think is important too. Um, and kind of winding down here, I think we've got some good stuff. I would like to talk with people afterwards. We want to continue doing this, and so let's do it. And don't let funding get in the way. Let's find it. If it's important enough, the resources will come. It'll happen. Um, market research and planning, it's something that we don't do here. You know, people people say, yeah, I think I think people would like to buy a Spallanthus, so... <laughs> <laughs> Now, and there's, there's more research of, um, that, that's waiting to happen, to Chris's point. Um, and would you like this to continue? Would somebody like to continue the conversation to make some of this stuff happen? I would. Um, I, a question I have, we're talking about a lot of individual entrepreneurial efforts, some collective overlap. I, I'm wondering if if we need some kind of structure um, to apply for grants to that, that you know would not take over all of these activities but could in some way umbrella. coordinate and be an umbrella. Um, you know, especially I mean the, the distribution piece is, is the one that's most
just shut their doors. Oh, yeah, that's not good. Yeah. So. And local foods was like what five years? Local foods has been going since yeah, five, five or six five years. Or six years mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is going to be really important to what I do, and I think there's a lot of people do here. So I'm willing to take the lead. I'd love to see you actually on the transportation distribution and yeah, here's some of these. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, I want to get a truck by like September. I mean, I got a truck if you want a truck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to do it. Okay, so let, let's um, let's wrap this up. And it, are there, to case point, a couple of people who want to, you know, how before you leave, transportation, food, uh, hub, uh, distribution center. Um, what 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 other ones would would jump out here? Those two are the the biggies. It's selling here and it's getting out of here. Yeah, those are the it's two still things. Home. I say. <laughs> it's still home. Right. It seems like Matt and Chris are the two. Two, right? two uh, white people. So if you want to pursue a little bit, talk a little more with Matt, maybe exchange numbers, exchange emails. Uh, Matt, you want to stay on that side. Chris, if you want to talk about your transportation, let's do that over here. Uh, Kelly wants to say something. Yeah, real quick, um, before everyone starts shuffling. I brought some information from the Colorado Agri Tourism Association. Recently, House Bill 1280 passed. It changes the liability on your farm. Someone comes onto the farm to buy produce or whatever from you, and they fall. It's the same level of liability now as equine and ski have. We actually have great big signs that we will give to people. You sign up on Colorado.com with their business name. The sheet tells you how to get them, and then you get the signs for free. And then this is the Agritourism Association. It's a new organization that's working on those agritourism things that the tourism department can't do. So things like where do we get insurance? Where do we, how do we deal with zoning in our communities? How do we deal with signposts, et cetera? So this is a different angle, a different light, but if you have this going on on your farm or you know people that do, feel free to take these things in there. A lot of freebie stuff in there to market your business. You get your insurance at farm with you. Uh, insurance. <laughs> 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 Another quick announcement. Another quick announcement. One. There are voting directories on the back there. If you don't have one, if you don't know your farmer, take a voting directory and, and go introduce yourself. Number two, in Montrose at Montrose Pavilion this Saturday is a food and farm forum. It's a conference. Uh, it's about the third or fourth year running. Uh, sponsored by Value Food Partnership, uh, CSU Extension and some other people, and Farmers Union, thank you. And um, the, in past years, it's been really good. This thing is growing every year. Great chance to meet and greet and, and to see uh, what's happening yeah. and the Western Slope. Third one, I'm going to embarrass Lynn Gillespie, but I'm going to say um, Lynn has just launched for this education piece and, and consumer side. Lynn has just launched a webinar series, The Abundant Garden. Course. It's a course of how to grow, and it's probably not for y'all who are farmers, but it's for people who want to grow in their backyard, who want to continue it. They're never going to grow everything, but they're going to grow a bunch. And um, it's taking her many years of experience and putting it into a course. And um, it's online. You can get there through the um, Living Farm website. And I said, may not be for you, but it'll be for your, your consumers, your customers, and people who come and enjoy good food. And so I encourage you to go there and take a look at that. Um, any, any big last words? Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.